Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Chiao Hong. Chiao is a graduate student at UIUC, uh, where he's been looking at network resource allocation in data centers. Um, as an intern at MSR Redmond, he was a part of the team that did the software-defined networking work. Uh, for his thesis work, he's been looking at software-defined transport protocols, and he's going to tell us more about it. So, over to you. Thank you, Hitesh, for the introduction. So, hi, everyone. Chiao from UIUC. And Really happy to visit here and give this talk about software-defined transport, a programmable network architecture we propose for optimizing cloud performance. So uh, to begin with this talk, let's start with the quote. It's anticipated that the whole of the populous part of the United States uh, will, within two or three years, be covered with a network like a spider's web. Any guesses what day this is from? Anyone? Which year? 70s. 70s? 1970s? Anyone? Anyone else? Very good, very good. Ah, it's actually from 1848, uh, in 1848 from London Anecdotes. So uh, this talk is about designing networks. And people have designed networks for hundreds of years already. And this is for electric telegraph networks. And so when people decide, but in the past, when people design different kind of network, they are constrained in different ways, right? For example, when people designing wide area network, they are constrained by where the population is, for example. And uh, today we are moving into the cloud. And what's so special about cloud? What's the difference about cloud? So today, uh, cloud service provider have built their own network infrastructure, such as data center networks, as we already know, and inter-data center WANs. They build their own backbone as well. And what's so special about cloud is there are challenges and also is exciting part. So first, it's very critical infrastructure we have today in the cloud because it's a lifeblood uh, for the service for, uh, for the cloud service provider. Deliver very important user traffic. Essentially, everyone is relying on this critical infrastructure. And also, it's extremely expensive, right? Uh, people have built those big data center and expensive one that capac high capacity goes across multiple continents. For example, Google has spent more than $7 billion in the year of 2013 for their data center infrastructure. And uh, um, so we also got this, uh, uh, we also find this a very exciting domain to be worked on. Um, so first, it have unified control, central control that you won't get in, for example, in the past in the internet. And we also have this new proposed uh, idea about software-defined networking that allow us to have more flexibly controlled <laughs> with the network. So with this, there's an opportunity for us to have a new architecture that can be feasibly implemented because of this you know, uh, new control, uh, central control of the network and have impact there. And SDN can be tied into this architecture to be deployed. So, um, so we have those challenges about uh, has to be run very efficient because it's expensive resources and you know it's very uh, critical. Uh, so let's take a step back and look at today's network and how does today's uh, architecture provide you? Do they satisfy our requirements or not? So how we run today is, uh, today's network is essentially we have a whole bunch of protocol, a super protocol with knobs and dials that you can tune about, like TCP, BGP, uh, so on and so forth. For example, we have some routing protocol you can run across, uh, across routers, or you have some uh, end host protocol run across this end host. They are very complex, but the key issue is there's no clean programmable API for them. Essentially, it's hard to optimize the network for uh, both performance and efficiency goals to satisfy the service requirements. And we think there's a key, three key problems for today's network architecture. First, it's not very flexible. 
they run some predefined algorithms. And if that's not what you want, you won't get what you want. And second, it's very hard to reason about. Essentially, there's a big gap between what those pro protocol can provide you, the property they can provide you, and uh, the high-level service requirement goals you want to satisfy in the network. For example, in the multi-tenancy data center network, the operator may want some high-level service quality things like, you know, uh, I want some bandwidth guarantee for the, this tenant, like three gigabits per second across this set of VM to that set of VM or some latency guarantee for the another tenant, or something like a mix of prioritization and the fairness for the rest of tenants. And that's essentially hard to do with today's protocol. You can't just take the, ask today's protocol, say, take my words and try to optimize the network for this. It's hard. And one another solution is you uh, devise some new protocol to uh, achieve your goal. But essentially, that's also hard because you have limited deployability with today's model. Often new protocol require changes at both switches or end hosts, even both, or even both. So to solve the problem, our vision is to make today's transport architecture more programmable. And we believe this can be served as a killer application for cloud network optimization. So that's the name of the architecture we propose called SDP, Software Defined Transport. So uh, this architecture is integrated with software-defined networking. And the key idea of software-defined networking include an open interface, uh, thin interface to the data plan, and also a logically uh, centralized controller where you can centrally control the network forwarding. But software-defined networking gives you only the low-level access to the network forwarding plan, right? It doesn't tell you what's the northbound API we want to ask us, uh, for, for example, to optimize the network performance. Essentially, what we really need is an uh, ecosystem that uh, uh, allows us to build around the optimization targets. So there's some broad consensus about the protocol we use today, like OpenFlow protocol. But there's a very little consensus about what's the whole control framework you want to do uh, to, for the network optimization. So to do this, uh, we built on top of SDN. And another important building block in our architecture is this also the interface to the end host. And then where we have another centralized, uh, logically centralized controller, host controller to co collect the flow demand from the end host and also allocate and specify the flow rate about the uh, end host sending behavior. Then on top of this, we have another layer we call software uh, resource optimizer, where we run our actually uh, optimization algorithms given the flow demand by the host controller, and also based on the topology information you get from the SDN controller. Also, you, get, uh, you provide this nice interface to the network operator so they can specify their service goals, such as you know, utility function or transport policy they want to enforce in the network. Any question so far for the architecture? All right. So this is the, uh, I'm, I'm going to briefly summarize the key result what we get when we apply this architecture to different places. When we apply this to the interdata center when what we get is we can carry 60% more traffic than today's practice. And then we found we have congestion-free network update with this architecture, and we can work with limited switch memory. So we have satisfied some practical concerns there. And also for data center networks, we find SDT will help us to save 30% 30, 30 mean flow completion time and help us to support three times more deadline flows than today's practice. And also, we can handle uh, thousands of flows, a uh, thousand of network, a uh, network size with thousands of servers, scale up to a uh, reasonably large size with very fine grain flow control. So uh, this is where I published those papers and the co-author, and where the the paper got published. So the first two part got published in CICON, 2013, 2012. And the last part is my ongoing work is due to present in Open Networking Summit next week. So I'm not going to talk about every detailed pieces of those contributions. But uh, today I'll talk about just three items here. 
So first we'll look at when optimization. When we apply this to when, how much benefit we get there. And then we back, uh, the second one, we look at the data center network. How can we push this central control limit in the data center where we have, you know, thousands of, tens of thousands of servers? Can we achieve that scalability with this central control? And then I would, if time there's, I will talk about my other related work. So um, let's first look at, when we look at uh, the intradata center one. The biggest issue today we are facing here is low efficiency. People run this network with very low efficiency without uh, SDT architecture. And we provide two examples to show you why. First, this is uh, the time series of the traffic workload measured by a production inter DC uh, when uh, at Microsoft. And this is already a very BD link. And, but you can see the traffic goes through peaks and valleys across a day. And uh, the cu current practice is because you don't have a very nice uh, a mechanism to protect the important traffic. So the current practice is you provision the peak so that your important user facing traffic will always get through the network. By doing so, the average uh, traffic utilization of this link is below 50%. In other words, uh, more than half the capacity is not used. But there's an easy way to solve this problem, right? If you can uh, have this nice, flexible control of the network forwarding behavior, you can leverage its traffic characteristic. In interdata center when today, we have both background traffic and non-background traffic. Background traffic are those, you know, replication or, you know, indexing those big chunk data you're moving. They can be delayed for hours without compromising their service quality. So by simply doing, uh, uh, if you know this information and do global rate control, then by uh, simply by rate adapting for background traffic, then you can fit the same amount of traffic with half the capacity. And those, you know, more than 50% peak reduction will help you either accommodate more traffic or, you know, you can delay your expansion of the network. Yep, question? Why can't you just use the scheduler at the higher level to just schedule the background tasks during the interrupts? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, so the question is, can we do this at application level? The issue is, in the one, we have essentially too many applications. And from the application point of view, you don't really know, you know, other, who, who are the other applications competing with the network resources with, with you. So yes, you can do some scheduling at application level, but that would be hard to, for them because they don't have this global information about the whole other computer, yeah. All right. Another uh, inefficiency comes from the inflexible forwarding of today's model. Today, people use MPRST uh, as a traffic engineering protocol help you to find the path, they call tunnels, and to satisfy the flow bandwidth constraint. So here we give an example where we have three flows, A, B, C, arrive one by one, and assume in this example, each link can carry at most one flow. Then when flow A arrives, it will take the shortest path uh, from source to destination while satisfying the bandwidth constraint. And flow C will do the same, but you cannot take the shortest path because it will conflict with flow B, uh, will fail to satisfy the bandwidth constraint. So end up it take the second shortest one. And so does flow C end up taking a very long path. And if you have the global view of the network and you can globally coordinate the forwarding plan, in the right hand side, we show a much better allocation about the flow uh, forwarding plan, where lots of lean capacity get free up, you can accommodate more flows, and the latency is smaller. All right. So when we apply SDT architecture to here, we try to maximize, uh, to improve the overall efficiency through the central control of forwarding plan and also the rate control of the end host. And one key challenge we face here is how do we scalable, uh, scalably apply this architecture to when, while uh, you know does not compromise much about the uh, computational overhead. Like we have lots of flows in the when, as you can imagine. How can we scalable to that scale? So we here's a couple ideas. One is to do hierarchy, right? This is not simply just one controller to every end host or switch. That definitely won't scale. 
we have multiple layers in between that try to aggregate. A, uh, for example, we have bandwidth broker sit between controller and end house that collect the end house demands and do aggregation and send the aggregated uh, request, bandwidth request to the controller. And on the another direction, when you get the resource allocated back to the uh, to the bandwidth broker, you will allocate uh, do more fine grain allocation to the end house uh, under its control. And also, we do this uh, uh, graph aggregation. Essentially, our algorithm does not solve uh, the, the graph in the physical layer, right? We do link level aggregation, like each node in our problem is uh, is a data center, it's a site instead of real switches, which actually could con consist of you know tens of switches. Do link level aggregation, and we also do flow group aggregation, where we only look at source DC destination data center, and then the, a few priority classes double. Also, we want algorithm to be run very efficient. So what we do re, uh, resource allocation is we allocate uh, resources class by class. We have a few priority classes. And within each class, there are multiple flows. We want to ensure maximum fairness. Depends on weighted maximum fairness. Depends on their, their weights. All right. So the key challenge here is how to derive the maximum fairness. It's actually a very hard problem to compete compute uh, when, you, when you have the freedom to choose the path and also control the flow rate. And today's practice will take up to minutes at our target scale of you know, 40 to 50 data center sites. And the solution we propose is an approximation algorithm that computes faster uh, than today's practice. Essentially what happened here is you do this in multiple stages and in each stage you have, for example, some upper and lower bounds limits on the flow rates you can assign to each flow. Then for flows, uh, we run standard multi-commodity flow solver to maximize the throughput while give preference to the shorter flows, uh, to the shorter passes. And then at each stage, some flow that cannot get what they want, we call those flows are freezed. And their rate will be uh, will get this fixed rate, and they will partic they will still participate in the next stages computation, but their fl flow rate will be fixed. Then eventually you go through this to multiple stages until every flow's uh, rates get freeze. Then you get the allocation. Those are the freeze the flow rate are the rate you are going to allocate to each flow. So although we didn't explicitly control the fairness within each stage, but this is great because. Um, if your flow rate is in the next stage, you will still get there because the other people's flow rate get bounded in each stage. And theoretically, we prove this is a, a, a alpha approximation algorithm. So alpha is some you know, performance and you know, runtime trade-off here you can have. And you can deviate from the maximum fair share rate by at most effect of alpha. Empirical, empirically, we found uh, this actually uh, runs much better than the worst case, perform, uh, than the worst case performance. And we can approximate this uh, problem when the alpha equals two, two approximation algorithm, we can achieve uh, uh, high performance while it takes only sub-seconds to compute. And this is a figure we show the comparison where our approach with alpha equals two can actually impractically uh, approximate the maximum fair, uh, fair rate very well. While for MPOST, which does not have this fairness constraint have in their algorithm, then can you know deviate from the fair, maximum fair share rate heavily and unboundedly. Yep. In your maximum allocation, are you assuming that all flows are network limited, or are you because flows can be host limited? You know, because of endos constraints, because of storage, they may not be able to generate a rate at the maximum fair rate. Do you somehow account for that? Yes. So when the end house send their flow demand. It was based on what's the you know, application level or you know, system level bandwidth constraint. If it can use only, say, uh, if the NIC is one gigabit per second, but it can only consume, say, 200 megabits per second, it won't request for gigabits per second. And there's some estimation here, right? Some, depends on application. Some application, you may better know your resource demands and how much bandwidth you can use. Some of them may not. Then you have to do some estimation and you know, learn over time dynamically. So you have a notion of demand estimation in the architecture? Uh, yes, yes, yes. 
Any other questions? All right. Let's move on to the next challenge. So what we are trying to do is achieve high efficiency in the network. And that requires frequent changes to the network, both forwarding plan and the rate control. So you're essentially reconfiguring the whole network in a you know, very small time frame granularity. In our setup, it's like five minutes or 10 minutes. And doing so may uh, create lots of you know, chance when you update the network. And in the worst case, that you may drop lots of packets when you are switching paths. And a challenge here is how to ensure congestion free even during the network update so that you won't get this transient congestion will happen when you are optimizing the network, right? So it's actually a very tricky question. And that's, let me take this example to show you. Whenever, uh, when there's an initial state in the left hand side, you want to move the target state in the right hand side. Again, assume each link can accommodate just one flow and you have two flows here. Um, assume you, essentially this is a distributed system, right? So you cannot change the routing forwarding at a uh, table at uh, different nodes at the same time. Right, and because there's a delay, you cannot accommodate. So suppose the flow B got updated first, uh, sorry, flow A got updated first to move it to the, to the lower path, and then you get a congestion happened. Okay? Suppose, on the other hand, suppose the flow B got updated first. Congestion will still happen, it's just in, at different places. So actually, in this example, there's no congestion-free update sequence you can find. So how can we solve this? There's no feasible solution to move flows to their, from the target state to the destination state without, making, uh, without oversubscribing during the update. So the idea to solve this is to leave a small amount of scratch capacity on each link, and that can be used to accommodate the additional flows during the network update. So back to this example where Assume in this case, we have a slack of the network, <laughs> which is the one third of link capacity we reserved. Then now each flow can use up to two thirds of the link capacity. Now we got a feasible uh, update sequence here. You first move half the flow B to the top path, and then you can move the whole flow A to the bottom path. And then you move the rest of flow B to the top path, and then you are done. You will have no congestion at any stages. So this is great, but this is just an example. So how do we find this in general? Does the Slack always guarantee you find a feasible solution? And we prove the answer is yes. If you uh, crafted this uh, Slack capacity in your network S, S amount of scratch capacity, we prove there will always exist a congestion-free update sequence within one of minus one steps. So here one step consists of can consist of multiple updates to the routers. It's just their, uh, it's just their uh, update order, doesn't matter. Yeah? I was wondering if you assume that changes in the network happen instantaneously. So when you want them to happen, they happen? Uh, or there could be delays between things? There could be delays, yeah. That's why we are, we are doing this. So how can you guarantee that, uh, that the events that you showed in the previous slide happen in the order you want? Um, so we have multiple stages, right? Within each stage, you don't have to control. It doesn't matter. You just issue all the updates, okay? But across stages, so you have to wait until all the updates in this stage, they are finished and successfully in installing the network. Then you can start the next stage. Yeah. Yep. So is that Slack a constant to overhead on, on the network operations? You're always losing 30, you know, a third of your network capacity? Uh, something like that. I will talk about how we utilize those and use capacity later. Why don't you just drop below the IMB back to 50% ahead of the reconfiguration? And after reconfiguration, let them go up, up to 100%. <coughs> um, then you lose capacity there, right? You lose, you the lose capacity there, that's the point. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you're normally operating at 100% on all links, right? You're going to reconfigure and introduce contention. So why don't you throttle them both back to 50%? Let the contention, the contention won't happen because the 250 is out to 100% of, of the congested link. But when the reconfiguration is finished, let them all go back up to 100%. You don't lose a, a third of your network capacity. Yeah, that that's way. one feasible solution, ben, but that sounds very similar to congestion to me, right? You lose half the capaci capacity during the update. You, you either let packet get dropped or you do raise throttling before the network. Throttle them back at source. 
So you don't get congestion in the network. So you lose half capacity for 10 seconds yes. and then run at full capacity for five minutes rather than running at 66 capacity for five minutes. Yeah, I will show you how to run 100% capacity during the update and also in the normal time. Yeah. All right. So this is the way we found it. We formed a linear programming, um, uh, programming program to, uh, to find this congestion-free update. And the key variable in this uh, LP form is the following, B-I-J-S. This is the rate we want to control for flow I at pass J at step S. And so for, we have initial state that give us B-I-J zero, and we have target state give us B-I-J-K. And we, found, we want to find the intermediate states, B-I-J one to B-I-J-K minus one. And a very important constraint to, uh, to allow us to find the congestion free update is the following. Essentially, what we are doing here is to protect the worst scenario. This worst scenario specified that, you know, for any link, the worst case is for all the flows that try pass this link, uh, if they got increased flow rate after the update, they have updated already. While for the rest of flow who got decreased flow rate, they haven't. And we protect this worst scenario. So this ensures that there is no congestion will happen. And we prove this is will give us the optimal solution in the sense that minimum number of steps you will use, you can, you can use to find a solution. Now, back to the question I talked about. Why are we doing this, you know, crafted capacity? Uh, you are unused 10% capacity. That's also for five minutes. That's also wasting lots of uh, resources here. And it's expensive, so we want to utilize it. And to, the way to solve this is, again, we leverage the traffic characteristics. So for inter, uh, user, uh, user facing non-background traffic, we really want them to have, you know, no congestion will happen at any time. For those, we let them use up to 90 capacity and use the algorithm I just talked about. We can ensure 10% slack for them so they have, you know, smooth update during the, no congestion will happen during the up, network update. But then we, when we compute different classes of traffic, we compute them class by class, right? We compute the low priority classes, like the background traffic here. Now we allow them to use all the capacity during the normal time. Then, so that's how we uh, use all the network capacity during the normal time. But then, for then, they will, in, they will uh, experience some network congestion during the update, where the congestion is bounded and, you know, it's not too bad for them because they can be delayed. Yep? Each of your flows is presumably a huge number of actual application flows, right? Right. So how are you actually splitting a big flow? Is it on a per application flow? I mean, it seems like there's a very large number of application flows and each they could have any distribution of rates across them. How are you gonna split these rates without splitting individual application flows across multiple paths? Yes, yes. So the way we do is we try to differentiate apps first. So like different apps have different, you know, bandwidth broker that help them to allocate the resources. And then we have some fairness also. We do proportional fairness across uh, different flows within the app. So essentially there's multiple layer happening here, right? So for example, apps has lots of flows. App could have an app you know, bandwidth broker, and then bandwidth broker, you have some data center level bandwidth broker that collects the demand from different apps. When you go down to the end host to end host level, whatever you're calling that, the tiniest flow, right. do you ever split that across multiple paths? No, no, okay. we don't, we don't. That will create some packet reordering issues. We don't do that yet. So, but when we have enough amount of flows, so we can do very fine grain splitting across in the flow level. That's, we do some evaluation on that. and. We found that's good enough for me, uh, for us, yeah. All right. So let me talk about the overall workflow. So first, when we run the system, we collect the flow demand from the host controller, and also we collect the topology information from the SDN controller. And then we compute the globally computer resource allocation also the congestion free update plan. And if there's enough gain, we want to globally change the network. We first notify the services with decreased allocation, they can you know, reduce their flow rate now. And then we update the network forwarding plan. This could take you know, one or more steps to ensure there's no congestion happen 
to the interactive traffic. And then finally, we let the service with, with increased flow rate, they can start sending uh, with, in, uh, with higher rate now. So we build this uh, platform, uh, uh, we build this prototype with 16 uh, switches and the 32 servers for evaluation. And then we do both protocol evaluation, uh, prototype evaluation and data-driven evaluation that allows us to scale to the larger scale, where we take the, you know, this is the real traces from the interdata center one today. And for prototype evaluation, we found key, two key observations here. One is that SWAN can, uh, this is the project we call SWAN, can achieve very high throughput, 98% 90, of an optimal method. The optimal method assumes, you know, uh, it's unrealistic. Uh, Oracle knows every flow demand with zero delay and can you know, control the forwarding plan with zero delay as well. Control feedback loop with no delay. So it, it won't get into this congestion-free issues and no other constraints as well. And also we found this can achieve, fair sh uh, uh, can achieve very flexible sharing. So important interactive traffic is always protected, while the background traffic will automatically re-adapt it. And we also do data-driven evaluation to scale up to the uh, today's scale. And we found, again, our solution can achieve near-optimal solution under this practical setting. And this is using today's trace, uh, traffic traces. Try to scale up to see how much additional traffic we can accommodate. Compared with today's practice, we can accommodate 60% more traffic than MPOSD while still satisfying the <coughs> service requirements. And we try, also try to decouple the benefit from different uh, building components. So without the rate control, so essentially this is the case where you can only control the forwarding plan but not the end host <coughs> behavior. You got roughly 20% gain here. All right, questions? Let's move on. So next, I will look into how can we use the centralized controller to inside the data center, right? In data center, we need more scale, and the reason for that is we want more fine-grained flow control, right? Instead of aggregating the nodes and flows into you know whole, whole bunch of large chunks, we try to do more fine-grained resource allocation. And in data center, you could have you know thousands or tens of thousands of nodes and large network there. How can we possibly do this? Essentially, there's some trade-off between scalability and flexibility, right? Today's network transport protocol, they are quite, mostly quite scalable because essentially they are distributed protocols. But they are not so flexible uh, in the sense that you cannot program them freely, you cannot deploy them with uh, low cost. And when we apply to one, this is the case we got. We got very flexible uh, cases, but it's not fine-grained flow control. So the question here is how to push this boundary towards more flexible yet scalable uh, resource control. So here's a couple ideas we propose, uh, we, we, we adopt uh, to scale the transport rate control. The first idea is just use local control, right? Your central controller has larger time scale. You cannot control in, say, microsecond time frame. Then you have some local control you instructed in the end host. To, to, to react to that. For example, suppose you've got a network and a controller, you have a flow initiated, just use TCP or any other transport protocol that fits to control the rate before uh, the central controller allocate their, their commands to, to, the, to the source. And also in the network, we give high priority for those you know, new flows so that they can get through easily. And the next idea is we handle only long flows, right? There is a mix of long and short flows in the data in the data centers, and SDD cannot control when SDD cannot scale up to control all the flows. We control only long flows. So when flow started, they we assume they are short flows, so they don't have to talk to the central control. They just, they can just send with high priority. When they send, for example, uh, more than a certain number of bytes, they will be classified as long flow. Then they have to talk to the central controller about their flow demand. And through the global, uh, uh, through the central optimization, you will later get a flow rate allocated. Then, after you get the allocated rate, it falls back to, to be controlled by the SDN, uh, to be by, controlled by the SDD controller, and then also switch to the lower priority. Uh, 
data center. How is this different from proposals like Hedera from the UCS controls <coughs> where they were sort of using this controller-based architecture for long flows? Looks very similar. Yes, and the key question here is about the scalability we try to answer. And this is, this is the ongoing where we try to see how much, how fine-grained flow control we can achieve and when we want to do you know, more flows, uh, more fine-grained real-time scheduling in the data centers. So if you just look at long flow, it's probably EV, right? Depends on how large the flow is and how large the data center scale will be, right? That's what you're doing too. You're only dealing with long flows, right? Which is what they were doing. Right, 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 right. So I guess I was expecting something beyond long flows. We can do controller, short yes. flows, something else. Is Let me talk about the next idea. Yeah. So next idea is to do fast parallel rate flow rate computation. So essentially, we want centralized control. We want global view, so we want to compute in a single machine. But single machine does not scale up to handle you know, large network. So what can we do? We, we, can, we can use multi-strat. And this is a smart algorithm we propose to use flight level simulation to compute the flow rate using multi-strat. So, yep? Is the scalability problem the latency to the centralized controller, or is it the resource on the centralized controller that just sort of it's the, it's the CPU resource at the centralized controller. Yeah, so we do some back of envelope calculation and we found there's lots of overhead, right? There's a latency from the in-house talk to the controller and also the bandwidth for the control package and also how much time you need to spend on the controller and how much time you need to spend until the uh, you know, result get back to the in-house. It turns out when you want to scale to a large, net, large data center network, the computational time Computation time is, is, the, is the key bottleneck to prevent us from scaling up. I would have thought that latency would just be, because if you are talking about four packet flows, nine kilobytes, how are you going to get to a controller and back in a reasonable amount of time? Just following up on that, because latency, as a, I can imagine computation being a big bottleneck, yep. but yep. latency to the controller for short flows seems like just as big a problem. Right, right. So. That's what I just said is under the, under the assumption that my earlier idea get, get applied. So essentially, you don't control those very short flows. And the rationale for that is, you know, most, if you look at the data center traffic uh, <coughs> distributions, most of the traffic are generated by the long flow. And the majority of flows are short. So what you are doing is you can let loose of the control of most of flow while you still get the opportunity to control most of the byte in the network. Yep. What happens when somebody starts converting all of their long flows to short flows to take advantage of that? Yes, that's some, you know, that's uh, essentially you're asking how, how, how do we do when people try to gain the system, right? And that's a big question, right? Essentially, you can do this not just here, but also the traditional way, TCP, right? You can always create lots of flows and get larger total throughput. And that's something we think this is a future, in the future world we can look into, but we didn't handle that for now. Okay. So just try to give some idea about how this you know, parallel computation works. Essentially, the whole, uh, this whole thing will happen in a controller. Computer try to compute the flow rate for each flow based on some you know, service, uh, lab, uh, service uh, requirements. So essentially, you do flow level simulation. Assume you have two flows, they with uh, demand one for each. Then each thread uh, in a controller computes, handles the computation for a link. So based on some you know, operator specified transport policies, you do some scheduling here at the flow level. For example, suppose you want fairness. Then what we got, for example, weighted fairness, you have 0 0.7, 0 0.3 allocated to different flows. And uh, this link, after it computes, this information, you propagate to the next, next link in the uh, downstream links. And then eventually, we'll go to the destination, and then that's the rate you're going to allocate for each flow, and you'll get back to the sender. That's the allocated rate. So uh, there's other op uh, opt uh, optimi uh, optimization we apply to this algorithm includes, like we use a per link 30 bits so that to protect each link so that they won't you know, keep recompute, re right? If the input flow rate remains the same, the output should be the same, so you don't have to recompute. Uh, sorry, I didn't get 
Sure. So normally, Maxmin is done using a water filling algorithm. Have you done something beyond that? Is it what, what's the key idea here? Sorry. The key idea here is we try to. There's a two things different that you know water filling cannot do for us. For example, this is more general than water filling in the sense that you can implement pretty much any kind of uh, you know queuing disciplines here instead of just do you know max mean fairness. And the second thing is we want parallel compu computation that you cannot do in the water filling algorithm. So essentially here we each link can compute uh, by a thread. So what are the examples of allocation? So Water filling can achieve maximum fairness, weighted maximum fairness, and other things. What are allocation schemes that you can achieve here? For example, you can do prioritization. You can do bandwidth guarantee. All right. And another key benefit is the scalability I will show. How do you handle dependency among links? Because the point is that uh, you can't really compute, uh, you know, the right, frame rate right. per link independently. Because you know, once you find the bottleneck link, you need to recompute other links as well, right? That's a good point. That's a good point. So uh, I don't have time to go into the detail, but the high level idea is uh, we use this 30 bit to, to for each link to indicate if the input flow rate, right? Essentially, the output of the previous link get updated, then you need to recompute, right? That's the only dependency will happen across links, and we use this 30-bit. Uh, the good, uh, the typical way to solve this is you pu you put mutex mutexes, right? Because you have now this link for this link, I'm accessing here. I want to check. I will update this. Uh, I will recompute only when the 30-bit is 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 false, right? If if it's 30, then I will recompute it, then. You probably want to find, uh, ensure there's no con uh, concurrency issues, so you place mutex. But that will slow down the whole computation, and al doesn't allow us to scale uh, as nice as nice as using multi threads. So, but this is only just one bit. If you think about it, you can flip in a, a, in an atomic fashion. So what we do is you clean before you recompute, and then uh, you set the bit after you change the input flow rate. And we can show that you, this will allow you, you will never get into this bad state where you know, the link is actually dirty, but you mark it as clean, so you will never get recomputed. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, perhaps we can pull up there. Okay, thank you. Cool. All right, and, and uh, there's other uh, optimization we take to avoid oscillation and also ensure this is work conserving allocation. Um, let me talk about the uh, evaluation platform for this. So we have built this testbed at UIUC where we have, 13, we have 13 open flow switches and four big servers that allows us to drive 112 uh, one gigabits per second. And the result we found here, the access shows the network size in terms of number of servers. Y access shows the control interval with log scale. So essentially you want to small control interval while we give the constraint here is you can satisfy the flows, uh, most of the flow in the network. So the key results we find uh, within, uh, uh, within today's data center workload, with today's data center work, this central control with foreground flow level risk uh, scheduling can help us to scale to thousands of flows with you know, sub-second control interval. In that case, we found we can still handle more than 95% of the total bytes sent in the network. And the second thing is our algorithm help us to, uh, to, scale, up, uh, to scale up. With four threads, we got roughly linear, linear uh, scaling improvement. So this is one quick demo uh, I just want to give you some sense about how these things work, right? So in the right hand, uh, in the right upper corner, we show the topology we emulated. Uh, then we have four flows to send from uh, the same sender to different uh, destinations. So it's, it's one to many uh, traffic pattern. <coughs> and now I send this, each flow has 200 megabyte, uh, and without our SDD control, 
this is what we get. The flow will essentially shear fairly using the TCP today. And O will finish at time seven. Now we switch, switch back to our SPP mode. We are running you know, engine at end host to talk to the controller and reschedule the flow phase. And assume we do the same experiment again. But assume now we have some predefined weighted to uh, instruct it for each flow. So we're doing some flow, flow level, you know, weighted maximum fairness. And when some flow com complete, the, uh, it will recompute and allocate the flow resource to the other flows as well. And we plot the result, we can see some flow, for example, the ref flow who got higher weight, they can complete much faster because they got higher bandwidth in the, in the, in, uh, in the early stages. And by doing emulating this in software, we can flexibly emulate a wide range of scheduling policies without con con constraining by the hardware resources. All right, have roughly 12 minutes to be finished. Talk about my related work. So this is the two work I mentioned in this talk. And we also done preemptive scheduling with a distributed protocol, again, along this space. I didn't get time to talk about today. And I also did some work on wireless scheduling and also some sec uh, network security projects we have done, including this detecting malicious uh, proxy IP addresses using machine learning techniques. And also we do um, anomaly detection for the operational network using the big, uh, big network logs. And the technique here we applied includes uh, time series analysis and also hierarchical uh, heavy heater detection. Also do, I also done this bug read project we might want to look at the network traces and try to define, uh, try to detect the bots using simply using the network graph, uh, network communication graph. I also done some network measurement project, and the, this project called uh, Clock Scalpel, where we try to identify, uh, try to understand what's the root causes of the internet clock synchronization inaccuracy, and also uh, a data center topology. Uh, project. If you've got any questions for the talk, and I'm happy to answer for now. If not, I will uh, briefly talk about this jellyfish project with the last 10 minutes. Can I just ask a sorry, quick question on uh, your last uh, thing about this scalable uh, transport uh, service? So, how long is a big, how long is uh, a long flow for you? Because if it takes a second, and if you have a 10 gig network, yes, potentially yes. I mean, it must be very long. So for the results we show, the threshold is roughly 7 to 80 megabytes. But you are assuming 1 gigabit network or 10 gigabit network? Uh, 1 gigabit network. So if you are going to 10 gigabit network, it would be like a factor of 10 more? That could be the case. That could be the case. If you want to accommodate, if you assume everything is the same, right? So do you think you know, it's going to scale in a you know, no, the 10 gig network where probably, you know, the fraction of flows that you know are above your threshold are probably is very small. I don't know. It depends on how how fast the server server side also can server side also scale up by ten times, right? You can accommodate ten times more VMs there, then you get ten times more traffic, network traffic. Right. So it depends on which one is faster. Yeah. Yep. So so why did you exactly kind of use a centralized controller? Because it seemed that you are dealing with every link separately, right? So you could have a controller for each link. As in, you're not really kind of using the centralized, uh, as in, there isn't kind of any information that you are using beyond information for that particular link. Right? Um, it depends, right? In the, in the ingress links, you still need the demands for, for all the flows there. So, so if let's say you had a controller for that particular link, wouldn't that have all the information for that? Probably, probably yes, but you have to. Then you have to handle the the, the issue happen in a distributed manner, right? Now we are we are talking to across just different threads, and we have a lot of shared memory we can use. So we essentially flip a bit, then everything is fine. But now if you run this into instead of two threads, you run into two machines, then you have to maintain the state. You have consistency issue there. You have to be handled, and I I I'm not sure if that will buy, buy us the same. Same performance uh, improvement using multi, multi nodes. Yeah. So another question. So 
Um, how exactly do you deal with the short flows? As in, what exactly do you assume about them? As in, do you assume that they will be using some part of the link uh, in terms of uh, your own computation, or you just kind of ignore them? Um, we just kind of ignore them, give them high priority, and the controller will adapt to that. And because they are using you know, relatively small fraction of the total network capacity, just let loose of the control plane. All right. Let me quickly go through this. Uh, another interesting work I've done in the topology design, where we adapt, we call jellyfish. Uh, essentially, we use random graph topology applied to the data center networks. So essentially, we just connect data center randomly. Two key goals we want to achieve in this project. One is high throughput with the minimal cost. Essentially, you want to support you know, lots of capacity and to, uh, lots of throughput because you want big data analysis. You also want agile uh, VM placement so that you, uh, your VM placement will not constrain by your network bottlenecks. At the same time, today, people are adding, keep adding capacity to their uh, system in a daily basis. Like Facebook, we found they need uh, to expand. There's a throughput increase uh, in a daily basis. Every day, they get more and more uh, resources usage. And this topology will allow you to have EV incre incremental expansion by easily adding uh, server and switches without you know, having to worry about the whole structure. So this is how Jellyfish works. You have racks of servers. On top of that, you have top of rack switches. Then you form a random graph at the switch level. So this is what we call Jellyfish. And the name comes from the intuition that this makes the network capacity less like a you know, fluid, uh, less like a structural solid, but more like a fluid. Essentially, everything is random. When you add things into the network, you have EV, uh, a few cable swaps, and then you, get, you, you are finished. You don't have to maintain the certain structure as we've done in today's data center network like factory. Accidentally, it also looks like a real jellyfish. So one key question we want to answer is, OK, this naturally, uh, the sloppy uh, structure of the random graph allows you ED expansion. But how much, how much throughput we compromise by having using this random graph? So uh, this is the result we got as compared with FATTRI, today's structure topology people widely use for data center network. And the access shows the equipment cost. Essentially, we are using the same uh, using the identical equipment as compared to FATTRI with, jelly, uh, with uh, Jellyfish. And the y-axis shows how many servers you can pack into this uh, infrastructure while, uh, while satisfying the full sending rate so that they won't block by the network. And essentially, we found 25% more servers we can support with Jellyfish and at the scale of roughly you know, two, 3,000 servers. And the improvement increase over scale. So when I talk this to people, about half the people would think this is trivial. Uh, but the rest of half people think this is not intuitive. So it depends on which half you are in. right? But usually, we want to give some intuition. Let me use the last five minutes to give you some intuition why we got higher support than today's structured networks. Sorry, can I ask a question? What, sure. What are you running this? Yeah, we use uh, uh, server level uh, random permutation. That's the way we try to stress the network. Yeah. OK, so some intuition here. If we want to fully utilize all the capacity in the network, so how much throughput we can get in the left hand side of this uh, equation is the total capacity over the use capacity per flow, right? So, total capacity is essentially how many links and what's the capacity per link. And the use capacity per flow is how many flows and what's, how many hop counts, how many hops they go. OK? If you given this network, then you cannot change. The thing you cannot change is the link capacity, right? That's the budget you have. So if you want to maximize the throughput, you want to minimize the mean path length. So that's our mission, to minimize the mean path length. Then we look at Jellyfish and compare it with today's 
structural network like a fat tree in the left hand side. Well, this is probably too large scale to, to, to be useful to see. So we look at a smaller scale graph where they have exactly the same uh, number of servers, number of switches, number of degree. Okay? It's just in the fat tree, you have this clean layers, you have fat, you have a uh, larger core in the, uh, in the network core, and you have thinner in the, in the edge. While in the jellyfish, it's a randomly generated graph. Okay. So let's randomly choose our origin for both graph, and then move from the origin one hop, two hops, three, four, five. So up to five hops. In Jellyfish, we already reached 12 out of 16 servers, while there's only four servers can be reachable in five hop in Fat3. And the main reason why we can reach most of the servers in the shorter path length, in theory, we, it's because it's a good expander. Uh, you can expand, you can reach out the larger set of servers in, uh, in the fewer hop counts. And if you look at Fat3, uh, to understand why fat tree is so bad in terms of mean, uh, in, in terms of path lens, you can actually, for those links in the red colors, dotted red color, you can read most of the links in fat tree are not useful to re, uh, to reduce the uh, path lens. I can remove all those red links, and while the mean path lens will remain the same. So what we know so far is this random graph will give you high throughput as well as uh, flexible expandability. Yes? Uh, what happens if you go to a different pattern like O2O? O2O? Oh. Yeah. yeah, actually O2O is, we think it's somewhat easier than random permutation. Essentially O2O you have flexibility there to, to go to everywhere. And we look at those different traffic patterns as well by our uh, flow level simulation and we got similar results. Okay, sure, let me wrap up. So this is just the beginning, and I have one minute, I cannot talk about this uh, in details, but there are the things we also look into in our research, like can we do even better? Is the random graph is the best solution? Is there any optimal graph that gives you a better solution? And also look at system design, sorry. Also we look into system, system design issues, like random graph people will always feel scary that can I generate a terribly bad graph that even you know get disconnected. Or uh, cabling issues, it's like a cabling spaghetti monster you're handling like lots of random cables go around switches. And how to do routing and congestion control without today's you know structure. All right, I think I will stop here and if you have any questions I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Oh, just a quick question. So it, it sounds like with your random graph, see, and, and I think that's one of those bullets you're saying, you make it operationally harder, right, to maintain it in a data center. Sorry, which one? Operation. Operation harder? Graphs. Okay. Right, because... What kind of the operation you are thinking? Well, the guy who goes there and cables stuff and connects things, right, has to maintain that uh, the network, right? So how does he know what has to connect things? He goes around with a top coin tossing? Right, right. Like okay, so first of all, uh, let me show you something fun. <laughs> okay, this is a test bed I use for the demo video, and uh, one natural question is: This looks like a jellyfish. You know, cable is quite messy here. And do I really build this? And the uh, answer is yes. And the proof is this picture. Well, <laughs> we connect them randomly, but. In practice, you won't do this. This is a bad example, essentially. It is a bad example. I hope so, yeah. yeah. So what we do in, in data center, for example, what we really do is for fat tree and jellyfish, you both create a blueprint about you know, how to, which port of the switches connect to which port of switches. And then the people who actually do this you know, cabling and stuff, they just follow the blueprint and you know, connect them accordingly. So there's, if, if you think about the cabling, there's not much differences between jellyfish or fat tree. Because essentially you, you just get a blueprint and you just follow the instruction and connect them. Yeah, 
I agree with what you said, but I yep. think it's that simple, right? Because you have to maintain it. You're expanding the data center, things fail, and you have to, to recable. Uh, it's, it's not a one-time thing. Right, right, right. So we, we do have some evaluation about that. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to follow up and say, I mean, the factory has a number of other well understood properties about right. what happens in the event of a particular individual right. link loss and, and, and kind of uniformity patterns, and there's a whole lot of other things. I mean, I guess rather than saying, to me, this is not saying jellyfish is a good way to build a network, it's saying, at least from the bandwidth per equipment cost point of view, factory is a bad way to build a network because even a random graph can does better on that metric. <laughs> Right. Um, <laughs> rather than the random. Well, graph, actually, I have I haven't got time to talk about it, but actually, we formally proved that random graph is a class of near, very close to optimal performance graph. Yeah. Yes. I I haven't talked talked to that about, but yeah, there's. Maybe there's a sensible structure which is actually, you know, does as well on your your metric of interest and also preserves some of the other good properties. Right. Right. Okay. So. Two things I want to talk about. One is how far is the jellyfish away from the, the optimal graph? And one particular class of graph we look into is we call degree diameter bounded graph. And I don't know if you know Peterson graph is one example where we have 10 nodes about degree diameter bounded graph. And for that class of graph is you have constraint about degree and diameter. And what you want is you pack as as many nodes as possible to the graph. You want to find the largest graph that satisfy those constraints. And we think those are close to optimal for us because we are kind of, kind of finding the same problem in a different way, right? We have degree constraint for switches, and we want to minimize the diameter while we have this you know, network size constraint as well. So it's kind of similar problem to us. And when we look into those, today people don't have a very nice algorithm for that. So only like five or six very small size, less than 20 nodes graphs are known to be optimal. The others are, you know, heuristic computed. And when we look into that and compare it with random graph, we see the throughput we got is roughly 90, uh, 86 to 95 percent away from them. And that's pretty close, we think. That's some good evidence about optimality of, of, jelly, of jellyfish. And another thing I want to talk about about operation, right? I think if you think about the operation cost is something jellyfish will be bad. It depends on how you operate the network, right? If, for example, for example, uh, failure detection, suppose some link goes down, you want to figure out which link it is and want to, you know, go there and, you know, update the cap cable. Depends on how you do this, right? For example, when I talk to talk to Microsoft data center people, uh, GNS people, I say, hey, this is a cool idea about jellyfish. And they say, yeah, this is really great. But uh, <laughs> the largest issue is today they have run some management scripts they are using. For example, they run this called um, full mesh pin, full mesh pin to pin every end house to every other end house. So it give, give you a connectivity uh, uh, metrics, essentially. And they use something similar to factory, by the way. And uh, whenever there's a link failed or, you know, a, a switch fail, they can easily, by looking at the metrics, and figure out, oh, this is that core switch's failure because you have this structure. So you can figure out, oh, this block fail. This represents some switches. So they can do this easy things to do. And that, that does not apply to, to random graph, right? But if you have a much better tools today to manage your network, then everything can be automatically done. For example, you run, you run this you know, link discovery protocol, which will tell you what your current graph looks like. And you have you know, blueprint about the original graph. Then you do graph comparison. You know which link or fails. Then you can easily, you, you, if you automize, auto make things, uh, make the management in a more you know, automatic way, and you don't have to do some manual things to look at that, then I don't think operation cost will be a big, big deal there. Yeah. And we also take that cost into account in the sense that jellyfish actually need 
a little bit more long cable than, than the factory because you have some long distance across different clusters. We do do cost analysis looking into that, including, for example, adding a cable uh, inside a, a, a rack, uh, inside a cluster, a pod, would took you roughly 10 US dollars. And for, for, for hiring the people who do the actual, actual uh, you know, do the actual, actual cabling things. And even after accommodating those uh, costs, we see we still get pretty nice performance gain. Those will lose you roughly just two, three percent at the scale of, uh, of, of, the, of the improvement at the scale of two, three thousand servers. Next time you speak. Thank you.